we know that Europe and the Americas were being transformed by the revolutions and the global immigrations that were taking place during this period. A very, a very well-cited example is, is that between the 1830s and 1930, anywhere from 57 to 60 million Europeans migrated to all points uh, into the Western Hemisphere. How many? 57 to 60 million mm -hmm. uh, Europeans. And of course, you know, the vast majority come to the U.S. and therefore set the conditions for its incredible demographic and economic growth. Uh, another 11% go to Argentina, 9% uh, to Brazil. Mexico receives less than 1% of the total. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons in the, in the literature that is, that is often talked about is that it's that one of the reasons that Mexico, for instance, loses Texas, entre comillas, right, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is that because it failed to populate that particular region with these European immigrants that were coming to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And when they finally come, when after that happens, of course, what the government does, especially after they lose Texas in 1836, is they begin to turn to this Mexican-American population. So, whereas Europeans b became the preferred immigrants of choice for the U.S., Argentina, Brazil, and Canada, in Mexico, uh, the mm -hmm. preferred immigrants, according to their own legislation, will actually become Mexicans in the U.S. Those people are given, they are put on top of the immigration pyramid, as it were, as the preferential immigrants to come and return to the country for the reasons that I outlined to you earlier, mm -hmm. the three reasons. And so... That's what I would say was happening globally. And, and of course, um, here in a minute, what I can do is sort of talk about how I convey this narrative, but, but perhaps you may want to translate that yeah. part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, bueno, le pregunté entonces a, jo a José Ángel, que estaba yo curioso un poco de preguntar qué, qué estaba pasando en el mundo durante ese, ese periodo, ¿no? Y bueno, yo le decía que algo que le, que le gusta mucho del libro es que la primera sección del libro toma como una, un enfoque global a lo que estaba pasando en el mundo. Y, y bueno, en ese sentido, es un periodo en el que Europa, este, Estados Unidos, se está, se está transformando, ¿no? Hay como una, una revolución eh, grande, ¿no? De hecho, ahorita que mencionaste eso, me acordé de, de estos libros de, de, de Hobson, ¿no? Que, claro que, que sí, que precisamente. Precisamente, Leo, sí. de las revoluciones en, en Alemania, etc. Exacto, etcétera. la edad de la revolución, ¿no? Claro. Ajá. Bueno, y él, por ejemplo, mencionaba que en ese periodo histórico hubo más o menos de 57, 60 millones de europeos que emigraron fuera de Europa a diferentes lugares, la mayoría de ellos acá a los Estados Unidos, y eso sentó las bases del, del desarrollo económico, ¿no? Eh, ahí por, por cierto quiero quiero añadir que bueno yo estudio economía como muchas veces el desarrollo económico se, se habla en, en términos de, del el cambio y la mejora tecnológica pero eso no es posible si no hay un capital humano no o sea, necesitas claro. gente para trabajar no las máquinas no se trabajan a sí mismas no en fin eh, y después, eh, otro porcentaje menor se fue a Argentina, decías el 8%. No, como el 11. El 11. 11, y, 12, por ahí. ¿Y a Brasil cuánto? Como el, como el 9, 9, 10%. Y en cambio, a México fue menos del 1%. Menos del 1%, ¿verdad? Ajá. Y, y él decía que, por ejemplo, una de las razones que en la historiografía se arguye por las cuales se perdió Texas, entre comillas, perder, eh, es... Se dice que es porque México falló, o sea, no tuvo éxito repoblando eh, Texas con esta con esta migración europea, ¿no? En el en, el, en la escala de, de la, los grupos que ven, deberían migrar a México del Estado mexicano en ese tiempo, el, los que estaban hasta arriba eran los mexicanos en, en esta, que quedaron del lado de ahora está, de lo que hoy es Estados Unidos después de la guerra México americana. Eh, déjeme cambiar de nuevo al inglés. Um, ok, so you know I think another another kind of probably interesting question uh, is well your your the whole book is about uh, these efforts of the Mexican state to repatriate uh, the Mexicans that uh, stayed in the in the in what is today the United States of America. Yes. And I would say, what is you know nowadays like 
currently we have like a huge <laughs> reputation of Mexicans again like there have been 1.5 uh, Mexicans right. uh, deported under Obama uh, yes. admi under under this administration so what is what is kind of the relationship with with what is going on today if if there is something like that well I think I mean it's um it's a very good question it's a very big question but you know it I think the the long history of these deportations should raise some concern and it should also raise some interest Leo because mm -hmm. you know as I talk about in the book in my chapter two for instance I talk about early Mexican expulsions um, during the the sort of the population of Texas I mean in fact I mean even though it's, it's kind of funny because even though um, you know Mexico's quote-unquote failure to populate the regions in the case of Texas it was actually too successful right uh, in terms of populating the region but right? <laughs> too many people came over right and it, it set the conditions for an armed insurrection against the country only you know a few years after they were invited in 1821 and of course by 1836 they're already uh, rebelling but in any event you begin to see expulsions of ethnic Mexicans as early as 1836 in areas where and this is not, I don't want to apply this across the board, but you do see some patterns in areas where you begin to have a demographic dominance of Euro-Americans, you begin to have incidents of these expulsions, or what the government in Mexico referred to as expulsiones mexicanas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, during the Mexican-American War, although you have uh, an official policy of repatriation and resettlement of the frontier, a lot of uh, expellees are also being expelled. Uh, there's instances in the 1850s where Mexicans are accused of collaborating with, uh, with freedmen in an effort to take runaway slaves into Mexico. And for those reasons, uh, they are also expelled and deported across the border. Those patterns continue to the turn of the 19th century. And if we go into the 20th century, these are much more familiar cases, I think. The most obvious example is the deportations of 1929 during the Great Depression, where, depending on, how you, on who you speak with, and these numbers are not only controversial, but they are currently being assessed. But anywhere from between, let's say, you know, estimates are as high as...